So, as you mentioned, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about yourself and why you stud started studying economics. Um, but just going back to a few things um, on your economic outlook. I know you said that people have spoken and spoken about Greece, um, but it was discussed in detail yesterday at our panel discussion, and uh, the conclusion was that some kind of fiscal union should be agreed upon. What are your opinions about that? I think if they want to keep the euro, then they're going to have to go down the route of a fiscal union because that sets up the ability to do fiscal transfers. So what I said about the convergence criteria, you can either do it in a real way, which is to actually have countries converge in productivity levels and income levels, but if you can't do that, then the alternative would be to have transfers. So in other words, it'd be like the United States. You would have some states which lag behind, but there's always a federal transfer system so that when uh, California writes IOUs because Schwarzenegger has spent all the money, mm -hmm. nobody thinks California is going to leave the United States. They know that there is going to be a fiscal transfer behind it and a central bank that would ultimately pay um, the debt. So that immediately should highlight to you the problems of getting to the fiscal union part. One is Europe doesn't have federal power <coughs> taxation in spending and countries have to give up that power, cede some of it in order to have a proper fiscal union. So you would have some powers at the federal level, some at the nation state level. Just like in the US, you have federal taxes and then you have state taxes and spending. Second obstacle, um, if you have a fiscal union where you cede sovereign powers, then isn't that really suggesting that you need to have some type of political union to oversee the ceded sovereignty and power? And then thirdly, what I said about the um, central bank is crucial. So this only sort of works if you think California isn't going to leave um, and the Federal Reserve will print money to repay its debts if possible. Right now, the ECB is not a lender of last resort. It's not set up to be a lender of last resort. And until that changes, because it sees that there is a political or fiscal union in place, then we're still quite a few steps from it. But I think the way I always think about it is, if I were to ask you, where are you from? Now, an American would say America, right? But would you say you're from Britain or would you say you're from Europe? Mm. If, you, if your answer is I'm European, then that's a very different world than when you say I'm British. In fact, I'm Scottish. In fact, I'm from Aberdeen. <laughs> you know? But your first answer wouldn't be I'm European. Mm. For an American, it's I'm American. Where are you from? Then you would say, OK, well, actually, I'm from Pennsylvania. See how there's a difference in mindset. So I think until that changes, I'm not sure that even if they design the perfect fiscal union, there will be a political acceptance of it, where people really think of themselves as being European. Do you see that in the future of Europe, though? I think there's some who do. Um, I mentioned to some of you earlier on that um, the German finance minister, Wolfgang Schäuble, he's described as the last European because he worked under Helmut Kohl, and their idea was to create a federal Europe eventually to have a president of Europe directly elected by the people. So I'm not talking about Herman Van Rompuy, <laughs> who uh, is, um, do you know what he gave people for Christmas? He gave them a book of happiness. There were like writings and poems in there about happiness and he's a haiku writer and anyways, <laughs> I'm like a directly elected president of Europe. I mean, that is something I think perhaps some in Germany see. Um, but I think in their view of this, Europe kind of looks like federal Germany. Because Germany itself is a federal union, and it brought together states and created a federal state with a central, you know, uh, used to have a central bank, a Bundesbank, mm -hmm. and fiscal powers over the federal uh, regions. And that kind of federal union happened uh, with all of these conditions in place. Um, but, you s but you just don't yet have that in Europe. Could it happen? When most people in this room tell me they're European, then possibly. <laughs> and um, I apologize for asking this. I'm sure you're asked this all the time. But do you see a future for Greece in the Eurozone? I think Greece has a choice um, that it has to take, which is, does it want, what does it gain from staying in the Eurozone? And this is a question that used to be asked at Britain. Can you have an effective single market without a single currency? Right? So you could be in the EU and benefit from the single market, but do, does that mean you have to share a currency? And for many, many years, economists argued 
there were a lot of benefits from having a single currency. Um, Britain's answer was no, and Denmark's answer is no. But 27 EU states, they're the only two for whom the answer is no. <laughs> 25 states in the EU are all poised to accede to the euro. So that just gives you a sense of actually how strong the, the kind of the pull is to join the single currency. So now for Greece, the question is, now that it's in, <laughs> should it leave? Well, the benefits of staying in used to be low interest rates. Mm. So that you can't get unless, you know, because, you know, that's where they were benefiting from. Well, I think those days are gone. They're never going to have low interest rates again <laughs> until they get a much better fiscal position. So the days in which the interest rates were the same across the Eurozone are probably over, in which case that was a main benefit the likes of Britain or Denmark didn't benefit from. So why else should they stay in the Euro? versus just being a part of the EU. Um, well, right now, they could get, um, if they go down the route of a fiscal union, I guess they could get transfers. Uh, but they already get transfers through the EU structural funds, which they can't use because they don't have enough capacity to use the funds. So they've got billions of euros of funds they currently can't use. So anyway, so I think this is all a way of saying, if Greece stays in, then it has another eight years of austerity at which point its debt to GDP ratio is unlikely to be sustainable. Mm. Um, so it has to ask itself, why stay in? When every single country in Europe recovers from recession through devaluing its currency, there's only been one European country for which that was the exception, and that was Denmark in the 1990s. Um, it tried internal devaluation. So actually, instead of, the way to describe it is this, so sterling has lost 25% of its trade weight of value since 2007. So when you're selling something from Britain, it's 25% cheaper. You've done nothing, but it's 25% cheaper. And this is why net trade just added 0.6 percentage points to UK GDP, um, and nothing's actually changed. That's called achieving competitiveness through uh, the currency devaluing, right? But if you didn't have a currency, then British firms would have had to reduce their costs by 25% to achieve that same level of competitiveness. So the question for Greece is, why stay in when the euro is so strong? It's trading over 132 today, 133 even, um, because of the strength of Germany and some of the northern European countries, so that it can only grow if it were to internally devalue. Mm -hmm. So that's really the issue. And by the way, what happened to Denmark was, it worked for a couple of years, and then they fell into a double dip recession, <laughs> because internal devaluation is that painful. But uh, Greek politicians tell me that these are structural reforms they should do anyways. So they actually want to see the reduction in costs. They want to see the cuts in costs. So they think this is what they should do. My worry is the Greek economy is now contracting um, at the pace of about 8% per year, which is the latest figure. Um, how much of it can the society really take? So it's a very long way of saying it's a complicated issue, but I think for me it comes down to what the Greeks really think is best for their country. And I'm not convinced that all of this has necessarily sort of been, you know, sort of completely talked through with their people, because mm -hmm. I think that's got to be the ultimate key. Now, for the rest of the Eurozone, if Greece leaves, well, it's a disaster for the banks. I mean, that's where the main impact is. When it leaves, it'll get a new drachma, the new drachma will be 50% cheaper, and it'll kill the banks, and anybody who's ever done business with the Greeks, you know, a company, you sell something to Greece, now you're going to be repaid in drachmas that are worth 50% less than what you've you know, learn what he lent. And that's the real, that's the problem. So when a country defaults and devalues and you get massive capital outflows, um, and that's the kind of contagion fear. That's the real contagion fear. It's not just the bond deals in Portugal. That's the real fear. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't be the, they are not, they wouldn't be the last country to do this. And they're not, certainly not the first. So it's manageable. <laughs> Gosh, I sound like a German. <laughs> it's more manageable now than two years ago. That's Wolfgang Schäuble. <laughs> um, it was great to hear you at the end there wrap up with a with a positive outlook. Um, are there any areas specifically in the X sectors or otherwise that the analysts in the trading and investment club should be looking into further? Um, it's a really good question because I think for the moment, quite a lot of people immediately when they hear the story of shifting from west to east think of consumer goods. That's your classic, if you have a rising middle class, you immediately think more consumer goods. And also it's a defensive stock in a downturn or in a stagnant period. So the problem with this is that the valuations of consumer goods are really high <laughs> because that's the kind of conventional wisdom. 
So I think in that sense, if you're trying to uh, find a play on the fact that emerging economies which are cheaper are going to grow faster and domestic demand is going to be more important, I think it's going to be looking into things like consumer services. Services are local, they're not really tradable, they depend on domestic demand, they're really localized to the middle class that's there, and they're driven by growth which is extremely uh, you know, internal. Um, so in other words, consumer goods can be provided by anybody and you, know, you get these high valuations because people are trading on multinational corporations that service these markets. But actually if you were to really go for domestic demand play, then possibly you could argue something which is in a non-tradable sector like services would be something to look at. Or okay. something which is very sort of tailored to that market like a particular technology, you know, uh, like for instance in Africa. Um, they don't have a lot of fixed line infrastructure so mobile telephony is extremely important. You know, so I think it's those kinds of things to think about in terms of investments. I mean, the other thing is obviously as they grow, debt markets increase. So there's a very strong argument for looking at more like things either like fixed income or you know, credit instruments because those are the kinds of things that will grow in the future. And again, those are very sort of services, not actually hard you know, um, output oriented. But anyways, nothing I say should be relied upon for investment advice. <laughs> 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 Because, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> I always feel like I need to make that disclaimer. Actually, um, I used to be a corporate lawyer, so what I okay. used to say at the start was nothing I say should be relied upon for uh, legal. Um, so if I tell you this is how you develop guanxi in China and you go give a big gift to some Chinese policymaker, um, don't say it came from me. <laughs> you probably just violated the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> and... Um, how did you yourself get into the field of economics? Um, I started off, as I said, as a corporate lawyer. Um, I did study economics at university and I thought it was fascinating, but I thought it was a little bit abstract. Um, which ironically, then I went back and did a PhD in economics, <laughs> so it's really abstract. Um, but what changed my mind in terms of um, how important it was, was that when I was a corporate lawyer and I was doing work around the world and I was you know, practicing in places like China and emerging markets, I actually I felt like I didn't really understand what was going on in those economies. Like I felt like it was, I mean in one sense the practice of law was absolutely fascinating because if you practice in a place where the legal system is underdeveloped, I mean it's just, it's like moving from New York where I was where you would have like, you know, one perspective would be 150 pages and it's all boilerplate anyways, you know, to a place where the entire company law or the corporate law is like 10 pages double-spaced. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, it was just very exciting, but I think I fundamentally, I didn't really understand what was driving the changes um, in this economy, and I, and I kind of felt like I needed to, I then saw why it was important to understand things like economics, because that actually gave you a framework for seeing, you know, how these societies are transforming. Um, so that's why I actually decided to become an economist <laughs> and actually look at some of these questions from that perspective. And let me just tell you, my parents were deeply disappointed. I went from being a highly paid corporate lawyer in New York to a uh, academic at Oxford. <laughs> so. But they're not so disappointed now, though. Oh, well, they're always disappointed. Of course, they're Chinese parents. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to be honest here. <laughs> How did you get into, into Bloomberg Television? Um, I think I found that a lot of what was interesting was the relevance of what um, the economics were telling you. So I was doing a lot of policy work. I was doing a lot more sort of uh, advisor work, you know, for the British government. I'm pretty sure I presented to every single department of the British government. I'm p pretty sure. <laughs> um, and also, and I was doing commentating work. Um, and uh, that, uh, that I began to do more and more. And then you sort of, you know, decide, do you do less of it or do you, you know, have a go and do more of it? So in other words, um, instead of running ragged across 10 different stations, you know, stick with one and really begin to shape some of the content. And I think I found that to be really interesting because um, it is such an interesting time to be an economist, um, but to have the capacity to uh, make it make sense for the audience, I think is really important. Because there's nothing more irritating than watching you know, someone on TV who's you know, saying something or another, and, and it makes no sense whatsoever, you know, because they're speaking language that isn't understandable. So I think I find a lot of value in doing that. Um, and um, yeah, so it's been, and it's great fun. I mean, it's absolutely, you know, brilliant. I can go to press conferences with the Bank of England. I know Adam Posen is coming. 
you know, and uh, say things like, so governor, <laughs> Adam Posen says, you should put your money in SME Bank. Wow, let me tell you, that's not the job of a central bank. <laughs> you know, it's just great. <laughs> so instead of watching on TV, I could sit there asking these questions, and then I don't get a follow-up, of course, because they're very strange. <laughs> <laughs> Surely a similar kind of value is found in the lecturing work. How do you enjoy that? Um, it's great. I think it's about, um, again, you know, conveying information, you know, feeling like you're actually adding something to the discussion. Because I think one of the things that Britain and Europe sort of lacks, are, and America is much better at this, and this is something that uh, academic economists talk about all the time, which is we don't seem to have the same kind of public intellectuals as you have in the United States where you know, academics like Paul Krugman, like you know, Neil Ferguson, they're really part of you know, the public debate, the public discourse. Um, you know, they are sort of active in shaping how you understand things like the Euro crisis or the austerity debate. And in, in Britain and Europe, there's actually there's less of that. So the space is taken up more with, you know, more by analysts who do this for a living rather than sort of a mix of people, you know, people from the city, people from academe, people from policy circles. And I think in that sense, it's really great to do for me because I do think you need to have this kind of discussion across, you know, different people coming at it from different angles to really make sense of what are some very difficult issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I raised your, actually we'll do a little vote. So, you know, how many of you think that George Osborne is right and you have to stick to plan A? Okay. And how many of you think that it's wrong and you need to go to plan B because the economy is now shrinking? Okay, not much of a debate here, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, but this, you know, this whole question about does austerity kill off growth, you know, you would need a good discussion around it, the same way that you actually have in the United States, where essentially Krugman would say, go to plan B. Are you crazy? And Neil Ferguson, um, who um, I just saw um, two days ago, because we were in Singapore together at this conference, you know, would say exactly the opposite. We don't really, you know, we don't really have that kind of equivalent here. So I think that's something that um, is very good to do, and I do enjoy doing it. Um, although, um, <laughs> although it is always very um, uh, challenging sometimes, because, you know, people, there'll be like one guy in the audience voting your way, and you're, you're, you know, you're thinking, oh God, how am I going to persuade the rest of them? <laughs> you know, but actually, no, actually, I think the arguments are balanced, by the way. <laughs> I, don't actually, I don't actually think it's got to be plan B. I don't think he has a plan B. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and um, how has your job changed post-2008? Um, well, people don't like economists as much. <laughs> well, people have never really liked economists, <laughs> mm. I must say. Um, people in the rest of the social sciences don't like economists because they say things like, oh, economists, they don't have a good argument, but they just turn up with some econometrics and therefore they have to be right. <laughs> you know? um, but I think it's really caused people to dislike economists after 2008. It's like the Queen going to LSE and saying, now, why didn't any of you clever people come up with the answer? <laughs> why didn't any of you see this, whatever it is that she said? And I think that part is true. I mean, I think e economics as a subject has become extremely theoretical, mathematical, technical. Um, and it's actually moved away from um, looking at some of the qualitative aspects that would have made this crisis seem more apparent um, so in other words, if you're just working out theoretical models on the efficient market hypothesis, you're never going to see that the, what was happening in the actual housing market, what was happening in the banking sector, which is extremely empirical, um, would have you know, consequences. So I think in that sense, academic economists were probably too far um, down one side and sort of missed you know, what was going on. And I think that has caused a bit of a rethink about what economists should actually look at. Um, mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but if you look at any of the forecasts that economists, academic, non-academic did, um, I mean, even if you look at the forecasts you know, now, I mean, they're just so off. It's, you know, forecasting is just not, not, a, not an learning. easy subject for anybody. <laughs> but yeah, I, mean, I think the economics profession as a whole um, has been under a great deal of fire. So anyways, I used to get uh, lots of bad lawyer jokes, and now people hate <laughs> economists even more. So not even the lawyer jokes and the economist jokes. I'm sure you've had plenty of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, have you faced any troubles thr throughout your career being a female in the industry? It, not, not really. Um, I mean, I do think, I mean, in, in law, there was an imbalance, but in economics, there's a bigger imbalance. 
And if you move into finance, there's an even bigger imbalance. Funnily enough, broadcasting is the other way. <laughs> there's lots of women. <laughs> um, but I think the issue really is um, women are more scrutinized for things perhaps that they shouldn't be. And it's not really clear why, because women study economics just as much at the undergraduate level. But somehow, it tends to sort of, it tends to diverge after that. Um, and I guess the issue there is, you know, what is it about? Is there something about the profession that puts women off? Or, you know, what is it about the structure? And I don't know if that part is all that clear. So I think in that sense, I have, you know, had to think about in terms of why it is that I've gone into it, but a lot of my students, you know, don't continue um, in this path. Um, so I think those kinds of issues are real. And I think, um, you know, and I think, you know, in different professions, there's going to be kind of different elements of that. Um, what advice would you give to our members who are about to leave university and go off into the real world in three or four months? And probably to say, you know, chill out a little bit, guys. <laughs> because, you know, you're never, it's never going to be exactly how you planned it. Um, my parents didn't think I would leave a great job as a lawyer and, you know, and uh, move off. And you, I think you don't really realize what you want to do until you've tried it a few times and tried different things. Um, and sometimes I know the stakes always feel really high, but the average person in America changes jobs seven times, like actual jobs, not just you know, within a firm. I mean, seven times, and that's the average. You know, so that means you have lots of, lots of chances to really work out what you want to do. Um, but the one bit of advice I will give you <laughs> is that it's easier to find a job if you have a job. So maybe do all the soul searching quietly <laughs> while you have a job. <laughs> oh, and also my other bit of advice is um, even if you don't think the job is exactly what you want and you know, some parts of it really annoy you and, um, and what have you, um, always do the best you can in the job you um, it just it makes such a huge difference, both to your happiness and um, to your employer, so which then makes it easier for you to go so searching on the side, <laughs> um, rather than you know. So you know whatever, you you know just think you're very lucky. You're a graduate. You're coming from a great university. You have great training. Um, you know you're so much. You're just you're really you know you've got immense opportunities ahead of you. Are you working on any different research papers right now? I'm writing my next book um, and uh, actually a couple of books. Um, actually, four. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. One of the things that I'm continuing is I've done a lot of work on China's growth. Okay. Um, so I'm yeah, doing a couple of books on that. I'm also writing a couple of, one book, which is much more for lay audience. Um, well, at least that's what my literary agent says I'm writing, which is um, you know, trying to understand what's actually happened in the world over the past um, 10, 15 years. So in other words, you know, trying to understand exactly how it is the economic structure has changed so fundamentally to be where we are today, where I'm showing you this kind of shift and you know, what the drivers of it is and what it actually could look like. Just to help people kind of make sense of it, stepping away from just going, oh, well, it's a big crisis. Well, no, that was only part of the story. And lots of people have told that story. It's about sort of standing back and saying, is the world really going to be different in the 21st century? Are we really going to be following policy pronouncements from India and China? Is it really going to be the case where you know, everything is so global that um, one, you know, one issue that happens in one country is going to affect what happens in other countries? That is a very different world from the world where America was essentially the center. Mm. Um, it's a very different way of thinking about um, you know, how, how your how you're, uh, world is going to change. So, so anyways, yeah, that's allegedly I'm writing that too. <laughs> so. That's brilliant. And um, going back to China, when do you see a world in which the Chinese currency will be traded fully as the dollar and the euro are today? Um, the Chinese don't have a time frame for it. Um, and in <laughs> fact, it's the, oh, but it'll happen sort of before foreigners get full access into the Chinese market. <laughs> They've laid out this three-step plan uh, for liberalization, the PBOC have. The plan involves having more outward foreign direct investment from China, that's in the next one to three years. Three to five years, currency RMB will become internationalized. And then from five to 10 years, foreigners get to invest <laughs> in China um, on the portfolio front. But that's the key. So it won't happen within 10 years. Mm. Because until you actually have free access into the Chinese market, or free enough access, um, it's impossible to see how there's going to be 
could be a fully traded currency because you obviously have to be able to move the money yeah. sufficiently across borders. So just doing it offshore isn't enough. So everybody who works on the RMB offshore says things like, is there going to be enough deposit in the Bank of China, which is the depository in Hong Kong, to take the offshore trades? Um, is there going to be enough money in there for me to execute what I need to do? And at some point, when the RMB becomes used a lot more, there's not going to be enough deposits in the Bank of China. They're going to have to pull money from the mainland, in which case capital controls have to go. So not within the next 10 years. Thank you.